Welcome back to New Rockstars, I'm Eric Voss, and The Incredible Hulk gave the Marvel Cinematic Universe a big green asshole who's always angry, and for that alone it should not be overlooked. Sure, its lead was recast with our lovable dummy who spoils everything, and because it's owned by Universal you can't really find it on Disney+. Plus. But as this asshole gets greener and greener the longer he's in the Blue Dungeon Mark II, the second part of this Infinity Saga rewatch turned up a ton of easter eggs, some obvious, some less so, like most of the Avengers sneak into this movie, but mostly this film establishes key rules for the the Hulk, which have been a huge part of why the MCU has been so successful. So let's break this movie down scene by scene. The opening titles rush through a prologue of the origin of Bruce Banner, played here by Edward Norton, recast from Eric Bana in the 2003 Ang Lee Hulk film. We see Bruce in the lab chair, green gamma rays on his face, a flashing danger sign. All of these visuals were recreated from the 70s Hulk TV series intro. Among the close-ups of paperwork are a bunch of Easter eggs. The name Richard Rick Jones appears in the comics. Rick Jones is a sidekick to Bruce Banner. There's also the name Leonard Sampson, a character played by Ty Burrell in this film. Doc Sampson is another recurring character in the Hulk comics. In this movie, he's a psychiatrist and boyfriend to Bruce's ex, Betty Ross. Rumors say Sampson could return in Falcon the Winter Soldier on Disney+. Plus. Betty Ross, meanwhile, Liv Tyler, was recast from Jennifer Connelly in the Ang Lee film. Connelly later came back into the MCU as the voice of Karen, the AI voice in Peter Parker's Spider-Man suit in Homecoming. Nick Fury's name also appears, Shield Command, Code Red. And then there's a quick shot of some Stark Industries schematics of the Sonic Cannon, the same kind that they later use on Hulk in this film. Stark will install this same tech in miniature form in Rhodey's War Machine armor in Civil War. And this same Stark tech also shows up on his drones used on Spider-Man by Mysterio and far from home. And of course, there's William Hurt as General Thaddeus Thunderbolt Ross, future Secretary of State, and if there is a one above all, future Red Hulk. Yeah, in the comics, Ross transforms himself into Red Hulk, and I have long believed that the MCU is headed in that direction based on a number of clues. Notice how in this flashback, Ross's hand is blood red here. Well, I guess hardly a smoking gun clue. But after a long absence in the MCU, the Russo brothers considered him important enough to bring back in Civil War, talking about some mysterious injury and transformation. Five years ago, I had a heart attack. I dropped right in the middle of my backswing. It turned out it was the best round of my life because after 13 hours of surgery and a triple bypass, I found something. 40 years in the army it never taught me. Perspective. Yeah, this dude keeps showing up for whatever reason. Infinity War, Endgame, and hopefully sometime later this year, in Black Widow, a movie supposedly set between Civil War and Infinity War, yet Ross appears to be de-aged to look even younger than he looks here in The Incredible Hulk. We discovered a possible AIM Easter egg in Black Widow footage, suggesting Aldrich Killian's explosive super soldier tech from Iron Man 3 could be coming back the same time Ross does. In this movie, Ross seems super eager to build on the World War II super soldier program, and even though the Fury's big week tie-in comic it confirmed they torched all the leftover blood samples in Stern's lab. Who knows what Ross could have gotten his hands on first. Now, originally, this film was going to open with an alternate scene in which Banner tries to kill himself. Actually, the origin of that suicide attempt referenced in The Avengers. I put a bullet in my mouth and the other guy spit it out. In this deleted scene, Hulk smashes polar ice, causing a shockwave that unearths, if you look closely, Captain freaking America with the shield. I guess just laying there in the ice like a caveman corpse. Now we find Bruce in Brazil, meditating to control his heart rate to prevent collateral damage in one of the world's most densely populated cities. Now this movie is a reboot, but does seem to pick up where the Ang Lee Hulk left off. It did end with Eric Bana, Bruce, somewhere in South America. Bruce watches on the TV, The Courtship of Eddie's Father, starring actor Bill Bixby, the actor who played Dr. David Banner in the Hulk 70s series. In that show, his name was changed from Bruce to David because, according to Stanley and Luke Rigno, CBS thought the name Bruce sounded too gay-ish. <laughs> if only those 70s CBS execs could see what Hulk Lean has been up to. Bruce learned self-defense and breathing techniques from real-life Brazilian jiu-jitsu grandmaster Rickson Gracie, who gives us the sickest anatomical visual of the film. I can't stop looking. Ed Norton reportedly did a ton of rewrites for this film, adding much of Banner's introspection moments. Unfortunately for Norton, Marvel is a very top-down process. Figers runs a tight ship, and Norton was later replaced by Mark Ruffalo, who was actually director Louis Leterrier's original choice for the role. Bruce fixes machinery in a factory. Precisa uma fábrica nova. 
a little foreshadowing there for how Banner will soon force this guy to get a new factory. And then Bruce bleeds some outdated CGI blood onto the bottles below, causing his irradiated blood to make Stan Lee sick when he takes a swig of it. Not a great time to think about contaminated blood in the bottle drinks in your fridge, is it? Now, to be clear, ingesting Bruce's gamma radiated blood would not cause the ingester himself to hulk out. That would require a transfusion and probably a family relation, as will be the case for Bruce's cousin, Jennifer Walters, in the upcoming She-Hulk series on Disney+. Plus. Bruce's butchered Portuguese causes him to botch the classic Hulk catchphrase. Não bom quando eu fome. Which I love because the Portuguese words for angry and hungry are nothing alike. It's like he was trying to do this. Bruce's Mr. Blue confidant sends him a white flower for a possible ermal remedy, which kind of evokes the classic flower scene in Frankenstein, the freak experiment violent monster that inspired figures like the Hulk. The failed formula he makes is bright green, and there's a recurring green color scheme throughout this film. It's like wherever Bruce goes, that green haunts him. Until later, we get a flash of vibrant purple in the serum Stearns used to try to restrain Banner's reaction. Much like how Bruce Banner's purple shorts in the comics really do the Lord's work in restraining other things. After tracking the contaminated bottle back to Brazil, Ross assembles a strike team at Fort Johnson, named after Kenneth Johnson, creator of the Hulk TV series. And we meet Tim Roth as Emil Blonsky. As he does in the comics, Blonsky transforms into the Abomination, but he really is already an Abomination, pulling a reverse save the cat, shoot the dog. <laughs> But hey, I guess he doesn't nut check the dog. <laughs> Bruce flees, pulls a Scott Sterling. And Shaw takes a moment. Here he goes. Scott <laughs> Sterling, the man, the myth, the, the legend. And he fights his work rivals back in the factory. His heart rate monitor beeps faster and faster. The scene uses this as a kind of ticking clock to heighten the tension. <laughs> kind of like a bomb about to explode. Now, the first time Bruce hulks out, the camera work leaves him mostly in the shadows and seen only through green night vision. And our friend Teens pointed out during our Discord rewatch along how the scene focuses more on the people fleeing him than the Hulk himself. This all casts Hulk as a classic horror movie monster, mostly unseen, kind of like the shark in Jaws or the xenomorph in Alien. And this introduction marks Hulk's journey in this film as a transformation from chaos monster to focused hero. And this thematic arc is also why I think this movie feels so apart from the rest of the MCU. While some may find it interesting to see the Hulk as a terrifying force of nature, his Marvel legacy is not meant to be hidden in the shadows, but big green meant to be seen. So while thematically justified, Marvel later re-greens Hulk as a more kinetic hero. In Mexico, we get this musical nod. <laughs> This is the classic sad music from the 70s series that played whenever David Banner walked off in the sunset alone. And then Ross explains to Blonsky the background of Bruce's research. We're aware that we've got an infantry weapons development program. Well, in WW2, they initiated a sub-program for biotech force enhancement. Yeah, super soldier. And I dusted it off. Got him doing serious work again, bold work. One serum we developed was very promising. Ross is referencing the super soldier program that created Captain America. And this makes Banner's MCU origin that of the Ultimate Comics, which links Banner's origin with Caps. And Ross is all about Cap's history. Outside his office, there is a sketch that apparently depicts Captain America. This would be before Chris Evans was cast in the role. And the serum he pulls out of storage later is labeled with Stark Industries and the name Dr. Reinstein, the alias Dr. Erskine used when he created the super soldier serum. You can also see the term Vita Rays, which are the rays that Erskine used to dispense that serum into Steve Rogers. Now, yes, it has been a bit of a struggle to keep these daily doses of distraction coming at you from the Blue Dungeon Mark II. Being stuck inside makes me feel a bit lethargic sometimes, so it helps to have a pick-me-up. Well, a big help with waking me up every day so I can keep this coming at you is Bang Energy. Thanks to Bang Energy for sponsoring this video. Every can of Bang is 16 ounces. That's right, there's no wimpy 12 ounce cans here. It contains 300 milligrams of caffeine, it's sugar free, and it has zero calories yet. It tastes great! With over 20 different flavors to choose from. One of those great flavors is a Miami Cola. Even if your chances of having a spring break in the city of Miami are down to nada, your mouth can visit there with just a great taste of this cola. Check out Bang on Instagram. You can get 25% off your order at bang-energy.com when you use the code NEWROCKSTARS25. There you can buy cans of Bang Energy, including their sweet tea, keto coffee flavors. You can also get clothing, fitness supplements, all kinds of stuff to be your best Bang self. 
Thanks again to Bang Energy for sponsoring this video. Get 25% off at bang-energy.com using the code NEWROCKSTARS25 and follow the inventor of Bang on Instagram at bangenergy.ceo. Bruce hides out at Stanley's Pizza. The name Stanley's probably a nod to Stan Lee, but also Stanley's played by actor Paul Souls, who voiced Bruce Banner in the 60s animated series along with several other animated Marvel characters. Bruce sneaks on campus giving pizza to the security guard played by Lou Ferrigno, Hulk actor from the 70s series. Ferrigno and Stan Lee also cameoed in Ang Lee Hulk. Bruce also bribes Martin Starr, who also later plays Peter Parker's teacher, Mr. Harrington in Spider-Man Homecoming and Far From Home. And last year, Kevin Feige confirmed that this computer nerd is actually Mr. Harrington, same character, adding one more traumatic event to Harrington's life. Hope the pizza was good, at least. Ross injects Blonsky with that serum, and you can tell from its alternate shade of blue that it isn't exactly the cocktail Steve Rogers got. Either way, Erskine always said that his serum amplifies whatever is already in one's soul. Cap always had a heart of gold, Blonsky always had a hunger for blood. On to the campus battle. One of the two soldiers who fires smoke canisters is a cameo by John Campia, who said he got in trouble for taking a selfie in costume. And they use Stark's sonic cannons. Hulk kicks Blonsky, awesome. And a few students record this incident. One is Jim Wilson, another sidekick character from the Hulk comics, friend to Rick Jones, who dies early on. The other is Jack McGee, the name of the reporter from the 70s TV series who tries to track down the Hulk. Mr. McGee, don't make me angry. You wouldn't like me when I'm angry. And their footage later shows up in a report by WHIH, the MCU news service that was later used as promos for later movies. Look, where do you people get your information, huh? What kind of news organization is this? Oh, no, that's right, yeah, one that's owned by Vistacorp. And this particular B-roll of Hulk was shown in Iron Man 2. Hulk and Betty retreat to a cave where Hulk yells at clouds. This could be foreshadowing of Hulk's coming conflict with the God of Thunder, Thor. And some believe that they could see Thor or Thor's hammer maybe falling to Earth but this has been debunked. That's just the boulder that Hulk had just thrown in anger. Later, Betty brings him some huge stretchy purple shorts, an obvious nod to the ones Hulk wears in the comics. Uh, I'll take my chances. Come on, just put them on. Bruce and Betty try to have sex, but Bruce has to slow down. Uh, this week's episode of The Big Question goes super deep into Hulk's sexual history. You're gonna wanna check it out. Ross's people track down Mr. Blue using Shield's server. The Shield logo shows up on the computer screen. And that Mr. Blue turns out to be Dr. Samuel Stearns, played by Tim Blake Nelson, amazing character actor who plays Looking Glass on HBO's Watchmen. In the comics, Stearns becomes the big villain, the leader, known for his big head and psionic powers. This movie later hints at that by showing some of Banner's blood drip down into his open head wound, cause it to bulge out a bit as a big smile forms on his face. The MCU has never again done anything with Stearns, but a few years back, Feige did admit that he was a bit of a wasted opportunity. The idea that he's still around has come up, but he just remains locked up somewhere, as is Abomination. Stearns' dialysis process nearly works for Bruce, but Bruce is taken captive, and Blonsky makes Stearns inject him with more of Bruce's blood. The mixture could be an abomination. Like Obadiah Stane's subtle ironmonger wordplay from Iron Man, clearly Marvel at the stage was hesitant to embrace the comic book names. Abomination rampages through Harlem. They shot this in Toronto, but they redecorated it with Harlem's Apollo Theater, but you can still see some of the Toronto landmarks. And Michael K. Williams has a brief cameo. Watching this rampage from above, Bruce decides to embrace his Hulk identity to stop Abomination, giving Betty a smooch and committing suicide. Now I know this jump is a bit goofy, and I did enjoy how it was parodied in Ragnarok. But thematically, Bruce's fall is a directional inverse of the rise we saw from Tony Stark in the third act of Iron Man. Stark was a morally clouded dude who rises to his better self to confront the demon. Banner, by contrast, starts the film as a nice guy who, when we break into the third act, must descend to the trenches to embrace his inner demon, directing that chaos monster into the focused hero. No, no, not, not control it, but I don't know, maybe aim it. Hulk and Abomination duke it out. Abomination spits out a tooth. Hulk will call this back when taking the Hulkbuster beating in Age of Ultron. Abomination uses his elbow spike to stab Hulk's chest. Marvel designers actually kept that scar visible on Hulk's chest all the way through Ragnarok. Hulk thunderclaps to extinguish the helicopter fire to save Betty and Ross. One of our first episodes of The Big Question did the math to point out how for Hulk to clap hard enough to extinguish flames, he would have to create a sonic boom that would cause Betty to at least choke on blood. <laughs> Fun episode, check it out. Hulk also does another classic range attack. Attack. Hulk! Smash! 
One detail I love about this, it's one of the few moments that Hulk talks in these early films. And as always, he refers to himself as Hulk. Now it sets up this recurring trend throughout the series that Hulk hates being called Bruce or Banner. He insists on being his own identity separate from Banner. So whenever people call him Bruce Banner while in Hulk form, he flips out. Bruce. We are not your enemy's Banner. You're Bruce Banner. Yeah. Right, 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 don't mention puny Banner. Hey, Banner. No Banner, only Hulk. <laughs> However, when people call Hulk Hulk or big guy, he cooperates. And Hulk. <sighs> Smash. Hey, big guy. <sighs> Sun's getting real low. Hulk, stop! Just for once in your life, don't smash! Big monster! Hulk defeats Abomination and exiles to British Columbia, where he tracks down Betty's pawn necklace. The package is addressed to David B for David Banner, the no homo name from the 70s series. And it's from Milburn Pawn Shop. Brad Milburn was one of the film's set designers. And his final shot mirrors our first look at Bruce, once again meditating. But now, the goal of that focus is not to restrain the chaos monster, but to release it as the focused hero. And it's a subtle way of setting up that big reveal in Avengers. That's my secret, Cap. I'm always angry. Now that moment is iconic because it makes Hulk active. Big green meant to be seen. He's kinetic, not the potential energy unlocked via meditation. Kudos to Norton for his efforts to humanize Hulk, but really he's always been more useful to the MCU when they just let him smash. Now the movie's post credit scene actually plays before the credits. Ross is met in a bar by Tony Stark. But that super soldier program was put on ice for a reason. I've always felt that hardware was much more reliable. Stark's words here referring to Cap, the super soldier literally put on ice. And by pitching hardware as more of the place, Stark is foreshadowing his conflict with Cap in the Avengers. Big man in a suit of armor. Take that off, what are you? Everything special about you came out of a bottle. So even though Banner's off the grid, it's a bit weird for Stark to have this conversation with Ross, but I like to think of it as a reminder that Ross remains the overlooked contribution of this movie to the MCU, a super soldier obsessed blood freak desperate for a rage monster that he is in control of, an obsession that I think will lead him to see the red. <laughs> Now, a reminder that you can join these Infinity Saga watch-alongs twice a week with us on Discord by becoming a patron of New Rockstars at patreon.com slash newrockstars. Our watch-along for Iron Man 2 is underway with a video breakdown coming out on the channel very soon. Comment down below, follow me at EA Voss, and follow New Rockstars, and subscribe to New Rockstars for breakdowns of everything you love. Thanks for watching, bye.